Um, all right, hello everyone, my name is Mohammed. I am a lecturer in the physics department at MIT, and I'm part of the physics education group that is responsible for teaching and managing the introductory physics courses at MIT, which are usually taken by 700 students every semester. And I'm here to talk to you about some of the usages of AI that we have tried in the past semester and we are trying to uh, experiment with in the following semester. And let me just start by telling you a little bit about how our course work out, the introductory physics courses A21 and A22. So we follow a blended learning model where a lot of the material and the learning happens online before class. So we have a very important pre-class component. We call that the learning sequences. Students have to do this before class. Learning sequences are collections of videos and text and problems so here's an example of Dr. Peter Durmashkin uh, explaining a topic with a video in the learning sequences, and this is a problem that students have to do. And this is all done before class on our MIT X platform. And then the next step is after students finish this, they come to class, and our class follows the studio style where it's more focused on group work. So students work together to solve problems on the topics that they have seen in the learning sequences. So it's more of a practice time in class. And then we have a typical post-class component of collaboration on problem sets and sometimes take-home experiments. So this is our model for how the large, uh, and like, of course, we don't have a 700 students in the same room at the same time. We have seven or eight different sections. So we have seven or eight different instructors teaching the same uh, course throughout, like Monday and Tuesday. There are four sections on Monday, four sections on Tuesday. And so when we thought about the teaching team, when we thought about the usage of AI within our introductory physics courses, we really thought, okay, this is our model and we have it. And let's think about what are some gaps that exist within our model, some issues that we know we need to improve on them and then think how maybe generative AI can help us with these particular issues. And so we came up with a few gaps or needs that we wanted to see if generative AI would really help us with. And so I'll focus on these three um, needs right here, which is the first thing is closing the feedback loop between the pre-class and the in-class uh, uh, portion of the course. Also helping students develop their own big picture of the course as the semester unfolds and generating physics problems for um, unconventional topics. And I wanna mention that we also used in, the, um, in this past fall, we use Archie, which, uh, which is a chatbot that is specialized, it has a version that's specialized to our A to one content. So we did use that and there was a talk about Archie in the morning. So I'll, I'll focus more on the other usages, but we did have this optional Archie tutor. Like it's a chatbot that students can interact with and ask physics questions, and it has access to all of our content, so it can be helpful to them. But I'll focus more on the other usages that we have experimented with, and let me talk about the pre-class, in-class gap that we have. So this is like the bunch of projects that we're working on related to that. These are the three main projects. And as you can see here, we have a big teaching team or physics education group that is really working on all of that. It's not just me. So um, let me talk a little bit about the first usage, which is the loop or the closing the gap between the pre-class and the in-class portions. So the pre-class, as I said, have problems and the 700 students finish up the problems with the learning sequences on, let's say, Sunday, 11 p.m. And then Monday and Tuesday have classes that should build on that content, and it does build on that content. But the main little gap that we have right here is we don't have an easy way of instructors, we have seven or eight instructors, we don't have an easy way for them to access data from what happened in the learning sequences that were due in the past day. So because we have this like huge amount of students taking this uh, learning sequences and the problems have, every problem has a number of attempts, like this problem has five attempts, students can work through their attempts and try again if they did, didn't get it right. And all of this data is like usually in MITx and doesn't get out to instructors so they can use it for the, the in-class instruction. So, to help bridge this gap, before the discussion of AI, we created something called the second chance feature, 
in the learning sequences. This is not an AI thing. This is something that we created about a, half, a year and a half ago, which is basically has two purposes. But the main thing here is that after every problem in the learning sequences, which is a pre-class component, there is a button that students can use to click on that second chance button if they finished all their attempts and they didn't get it right. And that's coming because we heard a lot of feedback from students about the learning sequences that some students have a lot of anxiety going through the learning sequences because they are graded. We want them to take the learning sequences seriously, so we're grading the problems. But as I said, we, they have a number of attempts, but some students get a lot of anxiety knowing that they're gonna be losing points, they cannot get it right, they're learning on their own, and they're running out of attempts, so that stress hinders them from learning. So we added the second chance feature where, okay, if you tried your best and you finished your attempts, then there is a second chance for you to get credit by reflecting on the mistakes that you made or like what is it exactly that was the issue? Like did you have a small math issue or like something in the physics you didn't get? And this serves two purposes. So it reduces the stress of students. Like they know that even if they didn't get it 100% right, there's a second chance. So that reduces, make them more relaxed working on their learning sequences. But it also helps them look at the solution so when they finish their attempts, they can see the solution in the learning sequence. So if without the second chance, they didn't get it right, they are frustrated, they can just move on without learning from what happened. But with the second chance, they spend some time looking through the solution and figuring out, okay, this is what I missed, I didn't really understand that part. This kind of self-reflection is very important for their learning, and it also gives us data about, okay, these are the main issues that are happening. Like these are the main difficult points in that, this topic. So up to this point, so we have this running for um, almost two years now and many students utilize it in the pre-class. So for example, last fall, we had almost 1,700 uh, responses through the semester using second chance, which averages to about uh, 130 responses every week. So students are using this regularly to reflect on their learning. And the missing piece, which is now we're filling that with AI, is we didn't have an easy way of extracting this information and giving it to instructors so they can use it in class and like guide their in-class work. And so what I did is I created, uh, I, I wrote a script that runs at the deadline of the learning sequence, so let's say it's 11 p.m. At 11 p.m., this script collects just the text responses from the second chance feature students describing their mistakes or like their issues with uh, content that they have seen, and sends it through the API of OpenAI to try to create a summary of a few bullet points. These are the main mistakes or like issues that students had, and this script automatically also puts the bullet points into a PowerPoint slide, and automatically also puts it in the Dropbox folder where instructors access the material. This is a Dropbox for instructors. So immediately, like at 11.01 p.m., this will be ready for instructors to look at and use in their classes Monday, Tuesday, so they can guide their instruction, and this is completing the feedback between pre-class and in-class. And we can also show it to students in class and talk about these are the main issues, we, we see your feedback, we listen to it, and we're trying to help you, and this, I think, builds a relationship of trust with students. So that's one element, one small element of just summarizing the mistakes and helping this gap between pre-class and post-class because I tried personally many times before going through the 100 responses every uh, weekend and trying to get some kind of summary to instructors, but it's just like, we can't really do it. Like, it, it, especially it's due 11 p.m. and like the first class starts at nine. So this is really a gap that AI is really useful to us to help because we cannot do it really effectively otherwise. So that's one thing that we're, we're starting this AI summary thing in the spring. But another thing that we already started in the fall is another issue which is again coming from students' feedback. So we oftentimes get feedback from students that the, some students struggle a lot with connecting between the different topics and different equations. Like it's, to them, we throw at them a lot of equations and modules 
and you don't necessarily follow, okay, here is momentum, here is energy. What is this versus that in problem solving? When do I use this? When do I use that? Where does that fit within the big picture of the course? So that's one of the most common feedback that students give us that they really want to organize their thinking as the semester goes and build this big picture of the course as the semester goes. And when I hold review sessions before every exam, that's kind of what I personally focus on in review sessions more of, okay, here's how everything fits together and like the big picture of the course, and the students find it very helpful. So even without the whole AI discussion, we wanted to incorporate more of this big picture building, concept map, creating, every student creating their own narrative of fitting and placing things together for, in their brain. We wanted to put more work into that in the course anyway. So that's a gap. And we created, we thought that maybe AI would be a very good uh, place to introduce here. So we created these activities uh, and we put them on MITx where students see all the material. And this basically asks students after finishing up maybe a couple of modules or like two main topics, we ask them, okay, now you've done this and you've done that, you worked on problems here and there. Can you take a minute just to reflect and try to say, okay, what is this? What are the differences? What are the relationships? When do we use this topic versus that one? Uh, when do we use them both together? So that's an example right here when we asked him about kind of the differences between kinematics versus Newton's second law. And students write down the reflection here about this um, the connection between these topics. And then this gets sent again, augmented in a prompt that has a lot of context and key ideas to look for. So this is supplied by the instructor by me. To the, uh, like, I take that answer from student, I have a lot of context before it and after it to tell ChatGPT, okay, you're an instructor, this is a student, we're looking for these kind of big ideas in the answer, please provide meaningful and encouraging feedback to students. And then students get a chance to evaluate uh, or rate the response that they get the feedback. So we did that in the fall. This is an example right here, asking students to reflect about energy versus momentum and what are the similarities and differences. That's an example of a student response. This right here is, is the corresponding feedback they got from um, the AI. And then that's how students rated Yes, and we, we had it as an optional exercise, so this was not like required from everybody, we just wanted to experiment with it first and see if it works. So when we did it uh, optionally, about 11% of the class uh, decided to use it, and for the fraction that decided to rate the responses they got, they gave it on average a rating of four out of five stars. So there is potential there that the feedback that they are getting is meaningful, but we are working right now on a research project to compare the feedback that they get from this procedure of guided AI versus the feedback that they would have gotten from actual human instructors. So we're giving exactly the stu same student responses to actual human instructors and looking at the differences of the feedback they get from the human instructor versus that, and that's like a research project to test whether this is a useful mechanism to use, uh, keep using in the future. So these are uh, two of the main things that we have here. And finally, because I'm running out of time, let me just highlight the remaining one, which is we also use AI for generation of problems, and in particular in topics that are not very conventionally studied in introductory uh, physics courses. So in our classes, we tend to explore topics that are not necessarily uh, textbook introductory physics courses. For example, we uh, spend two weeks in A21 studying the fictitious effect we feel on the Earth because it's a rotating frame. So we feel Coriolis effects and things like that, which are very important for atmospheric physics and understanding the weather and, um, uh, and pressure gradients and how things work in the, at the atmosphere. So these topics are very hard to write problems like diverse family of problems there because they're not, they're not like the standard uh, first year material. So we, we, we as an instructors, we can generate some problems, but we wanted to see if ChatGPT can help us generate more diverse problems into these uh, topics. And 
So we have a research project right now going, just focusing on the quality of generation of problems from ChatGPT, which is led by our uh, teaching postdoc, uh, Dr. Shams El Adawi, and um, a couple of other grad students. So they are now investigating the best methodologies to generate high quality physics problems from ChatGPT. And I think this is not only helpful to us here, it's helpful to every physics teacher around the world because this, if we have a reliable mechanism for iteratively improving the quality of generated physics problems from ChatGPT, that would be of help to um, all physics teachers. So I think that's the summary um, of the three main gaps that we try to help uh, to use AI to help us with. And uh, thank you so much for your time.